Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. There's a paradox at the heart of modern life, two core ideas that directly conflict with one another. On the one hand, there's the near doctrine that economic growth is good, that it will lift people out of poverty and raise living standards. On the other hand, however, is the verifiable evidence that such growth is pushing us toward disaster, that it's fueling things like climate change, pollution, and an unbearable strain on our natural resources that threaten our food supply, water availability, and ultimately, all life on Earth. One academic compares this tension to a snake that eats its own tail. Now, so-called techno-optimists believe humanity can innovate its way out of this conundrum, think green energy, but others are doubtful and see a resolution only in something called the degrowth movement. That is, we need to contract the global economy, make it smaller in order to operate within the planet's biophysical limits. In plain English, less stuff, less travel, even fewer jobs. In a consumer culture that celebrates doing more, this may seem radical, but it might also be the only option to guarantee a viable future. A rising tide lifts all boats. A rising tide lifts all boats. For decades, this maxim, basically another name for trickle-down economics, has been the prevailing economic wisdom. Foster growth and everyone will share in the prosperity. But Samuel Alexander, an Australian academic and co-director of the Simplicity Institute, told me a rising tide will in fact drown everyone. That's both a figure of speech and a literal description of the effects of climate change. Alexander pointed to data from the Global Footprint Network, which found that our current levels of consumption and waste far exceeds Earth's available resources. In other words, the way we use energy, fish, food, and forests, among many other things, is unsustainable. The Global Footprint Network estimates that we would need 1.7 Earths to sustain our current way of life. Bottom line, we're doing more than the Earth can support. And keep in mind, the global population is expected to dramatically increase from 7.6 billion in 2017 to 11.2 billion by the end of the century. So, folks in the degrowth movement are doing the math and realizing, uh-oh, something has to give here. And the only way to balance the equation in the minds of degrowth advocates is to reduce our consumption, curb our material wealth, and resist the imperative felt by individuals, corporations, and countries alike to grow, grow, grow. Degrowth, as the name implies, wants to reverse that trend. As Andre Gores, the sort of godfather of the degrowth movement, explains, quote, the point is not to refrain from consuming more and more, but to consume less and less. There is no other way of conserving the available reserves for future generations. Perhaps you were thinking, as I was, can't green technology save us from these problems? To use the academic jargon, can't we decouple growth from environmental harms like climate change? Won't Elon Musk save us? Maybe, hopefully. But Alexander asked me, if tech will solve our problems, when exactly will it start? I get his point. Despite decades of green energy advancements, carbon emissions are still on the rise. That's why degrowth advocates want to treat the problem at its source, the source being overconsumption. Yes, certain technology can be good and should be pursued, but let's not put all our eggs in some techno-optimist basket. Okay, so that's sort of the ecological side of the degrowth movement. There's a second interconnected facet having to do with social justice. Barbara Muraka, an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Oregon, told me not everyone is in a position to degrow. So if you're a poor farmer in Eritrea or Yemen, for instance, no one is asking you to give up a portion of your livestock. Actually, Muraka explained, the degrowth movement is rather pro-growth in needy areas. That means the overgrown or overconsuming parts of the world, think of the US, Western Europe, Australia, and parts of Asia, have to cut back even more. Put simply, the degrowth movement pursues the redistribution of wealth. Maraca told me economic gains from the 1970s onward have been disproportionately vacuumed up by the rich. While the 1% have gotten dramatically wealthier, working class paychecks have remained stagnant. Yorgos Kalis, an environmental scientist at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, told me the economic pie is growing, but our slice of it is the same size. So the degrowth movement seeks to close the inequality gap 
not just by enriching the losers of the global economy, but also by knocking down the winners a peg or two. This flies in the face of a rising tide lifts all boats or so-called win-win sustainable development, often peddled by the type of thought leaders who want to give back to the needy, but only if it doesn't threaten the status quo that made them rich in the first place, that led to such inequality in the first place. Alexander added that the very lifestyles that were once considered the definitions of success are now proving to be our greatest failure. Attempting to universalize affluence would be a catastrophe, he told me. I get his point. The biggest economies tend to be the biggest carbon emitters. Again, this type of thinking is radical in the context of prevailing consensus. Part of the problem, multiple scholars tell me, is the statistical yardstick we use to measure countries. I'm talking about GDP, gross domestic product. Susan Paulson, a scholar at the University of Florida researching sustainability science and degrowth, told me it's used as a shorthand for everything we love by people in academia, the government, and yes, in media. GDP send GDP GDP growth and send the global GDP soaring again. Paulson told me that despite the prevalence of GDP and the way we use it as a proxy for well-being, it is a fairly poor scoreboard for measuring happiness. She pointed me to evidence that GDP does not necessarily respond to our most desired goals, things like lower infant mortality, longevity, literacy, or mental health. She pointed out that while America's GDP might be the envy of the world, we have an extremely high incarceration rate. Life expectancy is going down. Suicides are going up. There's a drug abuse epidemic. There's an obesity epidemic. In other words, what good is GDP if it's not improving our lives, but merely improving balance sheets? And indeed, the creator of the GDP concept, Simon Kuznets, warned that it is not a comprehensive measure of welfare, i.e. well-being. All right, so that's a lot of criticism of the status quo and how it creates ecological unsustainability, persistent inequality, and growth without happiness. But what exactly will a degrowth society look like? Well, and I'm quoting from one of Callies' papers, and remember, he's an academic supporter of the degrowth movement, quote, we will have to do with less high-speed transport infrastructures, space missions for tourists, new airports, or factories producing unnecessary gadgets, faster cars, or better televisions. He also warns of an increase in unemployment. In addition, he told me there would likely have to be limits on advertising, which he said is designed not to inform viewers about products, but to create dissatisfaction and desire, which fuels consumer culture and, in turn, the overconsumption of resources. Morocco added that a degrowth society would likely put caps on the amount of money you can make. Frankly, this seems like a bummer, even a bit totalitarian. I wondered if degrowth would not only diminish economic mobility, but also threaten civil liberties like freedom of speech. But Khalees told me that there are bans on cigarette ads. Is that totalitarian, he asked? His point was that the devil is in the details. Morocco spun my objections on their head. She said that degrowth would likely reduce the number of hours each of us worked and reduce the pressure to climb the career ladder. That, she said, is a form of freedom and liberty. Paulson told me to think about all the music we'd be making and all the sex we would be having in our additional time. Alexander, whose degrowth lifestyle was featured in a YouTube video, told me degrowth would allow us to pursue a simpler way. You're exchanging superfluous consumption for more time, more freedom. For Alexander, this simpler way would allow us to have rich, rewarding experiences that don't harm the earth or contribute to inequality. Think bike rides with friends, community gardens, community groups, civic engagement, reading, writing, or even just being lazy. Let's not mince words here. This sounds like a socialist utopia. I can already hear YouTube commenters typing out, but Venezuela. Yet, Maraca told me, capitalism, socialism, communism, whatever ism, none of this is adequate to describe what degrowth seeks to build. We need to imagine a whole new system, not one controlled by some centralized state, a la the Soviet Union, but one that empowers communities and fosters local economies. A system that promotes what one degrowth scholar identifies as the eight R's. Reevaluate, reconceptualize, restructure, redistribute, relocalize, reduce, reuse, and recycle. I'm gonna be candid here. This is talk that generally makes me roll my eyes. For starters, I'm deeply suspicious of principles that are alliterative. But I'm also cynical about such sweeping pie-in-the-sky changes. But then, then I start thinking about a lot of the dissatisfaction I, and I know from polling data, many of you 
likely have with the status quo. Many of us feel overworked, depressed, stuck in dead-end jobs to pay off debt. We are running like hamsters on a wheel, convincing ourselves that sustained happiness is just one pay raise away, just one promotion away, just one more dose of retail therapy away. Alexander told me, human beings are treated like consumer robots. Insert a material possession and out comes happiness. But social science tells us that is not the case. After our basic needs are met, there's little connection between wealth and satisfaction. Paulson added that our growth mindset is closely linked to this idea that we're hardwired to overconsume. It's in our very essence to compete with each other for resources to embrace individualism. But, she told me, evolutionary biology reveals the opposite. We can't outrun lions, we can't fight bears, we can't outmaneuver sharks, but we can cooperate with each other. That's how we've ensured our survival as a species. Collaboration is our superpower. We can marshal it to create a sustainable planet and work towards equality. And look, I know I'm discussing a do less, consume less lifestyle while sitting in front of bookshelves filled with junk and tchotchkes on an ad supported video platform. I am an image of consumer culture, no doubt. And to be clear, I have my hesitations about eliminating capitalism. But the degrowth movement, or at least some of its underlying principles, does seem to address a lot of the gnawing discontent I have with the ways of the world. Because I'd like to leave behind a viable, equitable planet. But honestly, my greatest fear right now is that the only thing left of me 500 years in the future will be a coffee pot I use once that is still sitting in some landfill. Okay. I'm going to go live my life.